You're listening to Searching for More, a podcast of the Diocese of Arlington. On this episode, Father Bjorn Lenberg, pastor of Sacred Heart of Jesus Catholic Church in Winchester, talks about the meaning of Lent and how we turn back to our Lord, particularly through the sacrament of confession. We want to shift the way we understand God's love for us as a father. A God who's going to die on the cross for you, who sends a son to die for you, is not like a sniper out to take you out. You know, he wants to yeah. help you hear the good news and turn back. Hear Father Blenberg talk about God's overwhelming love and mercy as he helps us plan for a fruitful, healing Lent. This episode's host is Billy Atwell, Chief Communications Officer of the Catholic Diocese of Arlington. Father, thank you for joining me on the podcast. You're welcome. This is great. Thank you. Yeah. So it's surprising that we're already in Lent. I feel like with last year was a little bit of a blur almost at this right. point. But we're, we're getting ready for a, a penitential season of sacrifice and suffering as if we haven't, Wait, haven't had we been doing that. that for the past like 18 <laughs> months or whatever? <laughs> I think we have. But I feel like it's very easy to kind of have Lent happen upon you and not right. really prepare yourself for it and then not really have a plan, you know, going into it. So in terms of intentionality, what do you recommend for people in terms of uh, approaching Lent with intention and then really kind of carrying through? Right. Okay. So um, I need to join a gym, but I like to talk about being in shape. You know, having yeah. worked at a high school for five years before being a pastor, I use a lot of analogies because of the kids. Yeah. And so if you could think of the church setting up a gym where you could come in. Now, if you're like me, like, okay, this year it's January 1st or this year it's Ash Wednesday, I'm going to do everything. I'm going to do bench and squat and I'm going to do spin class and I'm going to do karate. <laughs> I'm going to like eat one cracker a day. You know, you think you're going to do all this <laughs> stuff. And then, you know, like by Friday after Ash Wednesday, you know, you haven't shown up and you're eating five chocolate cakes and you're totally giving up and you've thrown in the towel. So we want to think of Lent as a time we're trying to, what, what are we doing here? We are um, hearing the word of God. We are um, preparing for or remembering our baptism. We're doing penance in, in reparation for sin, but we're converting. We're turning back to the Lord. The whole purpose of this is to know the love of God and to realize sin is ugly. And our Lord paid the price for our sins. He knew us on the cross and he embraced us. But you know, that seed of new life was planted. The Trinity came to dwell in us in baptism. And we want to grow that through life. We want to increase our ability to be happy and to love life. So Lent is a bit of a training session. And so if we think about it that way, then maybe we can avoid, if you're a legalist or scrupulous, you're like, oh, this year i got to do like the ultimate Lent. And you become this total monster, and then you go home from <laughs> work, and you bite your wife and your kid, kids' heads off, and you're like, oh, I totally failed. So rather than saying, i got to go do everything in the gym, and then I throw my back out, and I'm never going to go back, you know, there are people in our communities, in the church, who are really holy. They're saints. They've got spiritual directors. They're training all the time. They're the CrossFit people. And then there are yeah. some people in very unique circumstances, a lot of people, you know, wounded by life and by the church, abuse, all these things, who are, are ready for a coronary event. You know, if they hear one mm -hmm. more piece of bad news, they could want to leave, and yeah. they are leaving. But most of us are somewhere in between, and we're wearing sweatpants or yoga pants, and we're pre-diabetic, and we want to eat chicken fingers, and I get sweaty reaching for a Diet Coke. So we wander around the gym trying to figure out how that machine works. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we're really embarrassed. Like, I can't even touch that equipment. Yeah. So, you know, for many of us, it would just be a good discipline to go to the track and start walking. Yeah. Or maybe say, I don't know what to do, so you sign up for a trainer or a cycling class or spin class. So, so that way you can say, Lent is a time to grow. It's not a time just to beat yourself up. You know, when Our Lady appeared to the children in Fatima, they were first visited by her. She showed them the love of God and her love for them. And then she showed them the reality that some people go to hell if we don't pray for them and mm -hmm. if they reject God's love. And the kid said, if we hadn't been with her, we would have died of fright, but she was with them. So we don't just start off by saying, oh my gosh, I'm the worst person on the planet, you know, and I've got to do all this penance because I'm a miserable sinner and I look at my past. No, we just realize you are loved perfectly right now where you are, and Lent is a gift. You know, it's even fascinating, you know, where sin abounds, grace abounds the more. We live in a very secular culture. There are a lot of wounds to people and in the church. There's a lot of negative, if you will, energy out there towards a Catholic or a Christian. So you can be just really overwhelmed. But you realize God is pouring more love, more grace, more mercy into our lives today. So Lent is really a gift. <laughs> it's not, not my, my favorite day here is Fat Tuesday, not Ash Wednesday. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, still, when you realize the science that's coming out shows us how good fasting is. 
Yeah, it's it's become a secular trend totally. because it's good for you physically. We and totally I think is. some of the Catholics are putting their hands up in the air and saying, "We've been doing this for right. two thousand years. Right. Where are you just catching up?" Actually, before that, because obviously Jews fast. Right, also. right, yeah. right, right. But I think it's fascinating too because for a lot of times, you know, there's this phrase like "law precedes love." So you have a discipline before you grow into why am I obeying the law or why should I be kind to people or why should I not speed? You know, once you understand this is charity and I'm trying to help my neighbor and I'm trying to do mm-hmm. the right thing to build up community. So when we're growing up as kids or teenagers, you know, um, oh, I have to fast or oh, I have to give something up. What are you giving up? You know, Father, what are you giving up? And then you start realizing, well, this is really good for you. And that's what I find fascinating. The science is showing this discipline that the church and Christians and other believers have had for millennia is really good for you. Now, is it fun? No. Do I do it with a spirit of conversion and a reparation to heal, make up for what I've done in the past? Yes. But it's also ultimately good for you. And so a lot of secular people are really buying into the fasting and intermittent fasting, all these different things. And so now you can say, wow, you know, before I was just like a miserable Catholic with Catholic guilt. Well, no, that really wasn't what the church was doing. Right. But that's our impression. All right. And if we don't understand the why, you know, why am I going to do this? You know, um, And so, like uh, Viktor Frankl, who survived uh, Auschwitz, said, the person who has a why can endure any how. Hmm. This is terms of just having purpose in life and enduring suffering and hardship. If you have a reason to get out of bed, or Fulton Sheen would say, you know, life's worth living. You have a reason to live. So if there is a reason for Lent, then we go, oh. This is ultimately a way of connecting with the love of God. It's not just like scourging myself and seeing how this awful person or seeing how miserable I can be. But, you know, it's painful. It's like, again, it's like working out. You could be like, you could have a drill sergeant who yells at you because a drill sergeant's job is to get you ready for war. And war is hell. And so your mom's not going to be there. Your best friend's not going to be there. So they got to prepare for when the bullets are whizzing at you and you're getting shot at. Whereas a trainer isn't the same thing as a drill sergeant. Now, they're going to say, oh, I was Oprah's trainer, and I played for this football <laughs> team, and I'm going to get you in shape, and we're going to do keto, and you're going to hate me sometimes, but it's good for you. And you're going to trust the trainer. First of all, you're paying for it. And secondly, you realize the trainer, in a sense, seems to more have your goodwill at heart. Right. And so when you look that God is not really a drill sergeant, yes, we want to avoid hell, but you know, we want to avoid overdosing on drugs, and we want to avoid heart disease, but you don't spend your whole life living in fear of having a heart attack. Right. You know, or am I going to OD because I smoked a cigarette? So we want to shift the way we understand God's love for us as a father. A God who's going to die on the cross for you, who sends his son to die for you, is not like a sniper out to take you out. You know, he wants to help you hear the good news and turn back. Yeah. You know, I I simplify it sometimes in my own mind just by how I talk to my my children. Yeah. So like yesterday, my son did something he wasn't supposed to, and he was very upset about it. I could tell he was like feeling like kind of shame for it. So I I sat down and I said, I said, Liam, you're a good boy who made a mistake. You did something bad. Right. I said, here's the good news. You get to get up tomorrow and not do that thing again. Right. I didn't want him to think back and just, I'm terrible. I've done, because that's kind of where he was going with it. And I feel like sometimes we need that same shakeup of, you know, repent. Right. You know, but like feel enough of the pain from what you did that you don't do it again. Right. And like that's the kind of suffering that will maybe motivate you to to do the right thing and to keep your eyes focused on God and those kinds of things. How does the, 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 the suffering and, you know, fasting and so on, but the, the general suffering that we, we we're supposed to kind of embrace within Lent, mm-hmm. how is that different from any other literally ordinary time or, you know, a, other season? How, how does it change for us in that season? Right. Like if we think of Advent, Advent, we're getting ready for the birth of Christ. This is like time of anticipation. It is actually a time of some penance, but it's like making room, if you will. You know, if I'm a hoarder, I'm trying to clear space out in my heart to make room for the Christ child, you know, to realize that my heart is the the nativity scene. It's the cave. It's poor. But Jesus is coming. With Lent, there's an emphasis on repentance and doing penance for my sins. You know, ultimately, conversion, repentance, penance is a call to turn back to God. And it's a time of healing, but that could be painful if I'm out of shape or whatever. So, um, so it's more of an aspect of sacrifice. You know, I'm trying to heal my relationship with God, with my neighbor, and with myself. Mm. So you're trying to do some kind of disciplines. I make more time for prayer, 
you know, I give something up that I like in order to make that time for prayer. It's a discipline for me. And then like what I may give up, you give up your coffee or movies or whatever it is you're doing. I mean, with COVID, everything's changed, right. you know, but you take that money and you can, you know, or your time, you know, and both, and you serve, you serve the poor, you volunteer, you give to a good cause where they need help. Yeah. So now one of the ways it, it would seem to make space in your heart is through confession. And so in yes. our diocese, uh, we've done the light is on for many years. Absolutely. Um, for those that want to look it up, it's the light is on dot org. And basically it's there are additional confession times at parishes throughout the diocese. Yeah. And you check that out. That's something that our diocese has been very diligent about and has done it every year for a long time. Why yeah. do you think it's been um, so well received, and why do you think the pastor or the priest in general continue to spend that much extra time in the confessional with people? Um, confession is a gift. Now, none of us, myself included, when we go to confession, as I go, oh yay, I go to confession. I mean, eventually we really come to love it, and we know it's such a good thing, but it's still difficult. Um, but Bishop Laverty and Bishop Burbage, building on this, has they know as the shepherds of our souls, of our diocese, of people here in Virginia. North Virginia, that confession is a good thing. And you want to like remove the obstacles for people who are, who are reluctant to come back. Mm -hmm. When I was chaplain at John Paul the Great, Sister Mary Bridget would encourage me, oh, Father, because of the block schedule, we wouldn't just do First Friday devotions. We did like First Thursday and First Friday because you have A day and B day. Yeah. And so they, can we have some exposition of the Blessed Sacrament in the chapel? Sure. And then that moved into, oh, when the class is going to be in the chapel, maybe hear some confessions. And over five years, that grew from that to then it got to every First Thursday. Thursday and Friday, the adoration was all day, and I was in the confessional all day. And then that eventually grew the last three years that I would sit in the confessional during all the lunches. So we had three lunch periods. And what I learned from that is, well, my intention was kids in high school are growing, and they're great, and they have victories, and they have setbacks, and they make mistakes. And they're going to go off to college in the world, and they're going to struggle with a lot of temptations. And I wanted them to remember that when they were in high school, they could always go to confession and reboot. And so I'm kind of convinced we're all just grown up teenagers, you know. <laughs> and so now that I'm a pastor, I'm like, okay, I've got all these souls and these people. I know um, God is working uniquely in each one of their lives to, in his providence to bring them close to his heart. But confession is a great tool. It's a sacrament. It's this gift where we're being unburdened. We're laying down our sins and we're experiencing the healing grace, you know, like with COVID and <clears throat> people vaccinating and, you know, flu season, people get shots and you get sick, you go to the doctor, you try to explain to people that God gives a special grace in the sacrament of reconciliation, which heals the roots of our sinfulness. So you could say, first of all, well, why do you need to go to a band? I go to God. Well, Jesus, the day he rose from this, the dead on Easter Sunday, appears to the, you know, he comes to visit the apostles. You know, receive the Holy Spirit. He breathes on them. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven. Whose sins you hold bound are held bound. So that power to bind and loose, right? We know Jesus won the victory on the cross. He paid for our sins. He's our Savior there. But yet he gives this, if you will, <laughs> this distribution method yeah. through the sacrament of penance. And then over the millennia, you know, the church has grown in this, and the bishops know this, and they encourage us. And then as I find, in our diocese at least, that our priests know the value of good confession in their lives. And, you know, best salesperson is a convinced customer. Mm. And then I think the bishop's goal strategically is to say, let's make it available for, your, for our people. Yeah, And so by doing this, I mean, that initiative, I think, started in Archdiocese of Washington around yeah. the same time. But it's been, you know, I think now very well received. Now it's a partner received. initiative. Yeah, totally. And them. it's just like everywhere, you know. And I've heard priests say that they're surprised sometimes by how many people come in. It's been 10 years since my last confession, yes. 20 years. Yes. It's not just, it's been four or five days. It's not the same crew no, necessarily. No, no, no. You're it's seeing true. a lot of new people that are coming back. Yeah, and absolutely. And people come, and I think the more our, our experience of Sacred Heart of Jesus in Winchester is the more you make confession available, yes, people become hooked, and then they start coming consistently, which is good. You know, it's an ongoing thing. But then also, too, I think other people see the witness of they hear the news or they see the podcast or they hear the bishop's message, and they go, wow, I know I can go to any Catholic church in the diocese on a Wednesday during Lent, and I could go to confession. And you know that, I mean, not to get too creepy about it, you know the devil doesn't want them to go. So he's going to work oh, yeah. on them to discourage them. Oh, you've been so long. He's going to yell at you, you know, bumble, blah, blah, yeah. blah. And so anything we can do to bring it closer to them and more accessible, 
And then they get in there and they get in the door, you know, 95% just getting in there. And they see, oh, there's a line of other people, but there's multiple priests or whatever. It's convenient. I can do it. And then, they, you know, just like get him in the door. I think there was a story about Fulton Sheen. He used to hear confessions in the theater district in New York sometimes on the weekends at this one um, parish. I forget the name. But he would kind of stand there by the confessional because they would have mass like really early in the morning for the people who were in the shows on Broadway. And sometimes they'd come by and you'd almost kind of push him in the confessional yeah, yeah. to like, get them in there. Yeah, come on in here. How you doing? Say, it's all here. Take a seat. Plunk. You know, so you just want to help people. And yeah. so I think people finally get over that initial fear and their guardian angel and the blessed mother kind of bringing them in. And they and then they, you know, because again, what I learned in the high school, I'm just pretty convinced people want to go. Now, if their experience is I'm going to get yelled at or it's super complicated, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. Then those are a lot of legitimate fears. But when you can help them say, look, I'm here to help you. It's been a long time. I can walk you through it. I can ask you yes or no questions. You know, we can make it yeah. as simple as possible because they're like, I need a Ph.D. You don't, you know, or this yeah. is going to be a root canal or, you know, it's like I don't want my car detailed. Now it's kind of a tune up. Because remember mm-hmm. in like canon law, I think it is. It, it explains confession that the role of the priest is to help guide the person. Uh, I forget the way it's it, it, it's phrased, but I remember reading it one time and being like, that's a really beautiful way to think of it. It's to yeah. help like, basically guide the person to holiness. Right. It's not that the role of the priest is to make sure the perfect rubric is followed right. by the pedant. That you right. walk in there, it's like, right. if you don't know the script, Yo, you're out, out of here. <laughs> yeah. You what? You don't know, have your contrition? Go away. Don't yeah. come back. Give no. your Catholic ID card, you're gone. Yeah, it's, exactly. It, and I've never, you know, I mean, that's what priests want to do. I mean, it, yeah. it's, it's interesting that, you know, priests have different charisms, but they all, it seems like, love to help people like cleanse the soul and start fresh. Right. Like I think everyone right. can appreciate that. And two, you know, I, I always ask forgiveness for our shortcomings. You know, you're tired, you're in front of the parish, things are, yeah. you know, you're cranky, you haven't had, your blood sugar's low, and you're like, I thought I was being nice. I'm in the confessional. I am being generous, you know. <laughs> and then you're like, why are you so cranky? I'm not cranky, you know. And, yeah. and so you're like, oh, that makes it harder. So, you know, you're always kind of doing yeah. an examination of conscience too. How, how is my presence? Right. Know, am I welcoming? So. Yeah. So uh, through Lent, we fast on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. But in addition to that, we abstain from uh, meat on Fridays throughout Lent. Talk about, you know, kind of the history of this practice. Like, why do we do that? Right. The church, um, I mean, it's interesting because people want to, we want to dive in, have a real intense Lent or, whoa, Lent, you know, just like doing a polar bear plunge. Well, (laughs) liturgically, Lent is, the liturgical law defines Lent. You know, it starts midnight Ash Wednesday to the Mass of the Lord's Supper on Holy Thursday, inc- exclusive. So that's defining Lent. So it's a little bit more than 40 days. Yeah. And um, But then the church in the past has had times that the disciplines were more strict, but currently the church defines by her liturgical law and our other laws what Lent is. And so she, in the modern world as a mother, has said, you give up meat on Ash Wednesday and, and we, we, on, the, on all the Fridays of Lent. Mm-hmm except with their exceptions for people for medical reasons, health reasons, age and things. So somebody from the age of 14 to is it 59, you give up meat and fasting is 18 to 59. And mm-hmm. so um, I might be wrong on the age top yeah, limit for the meat. Fine. But the, the thing is to do a penance out of sacrifice because our Lord died on Friday. And then, you know, then it gets really interesting. Some people like to geek out on this stuff. Well, what's meat? You know, and whatever. Yeah. But we do this as a sacrifice because the Friday is the day that the Lord was crucified. And the, the season of Lent, you know, he's in the desert for 40 days. He's going to give his life on the cross for us on Friday. And so these penitential disciplines are kind of a way of getting our attention and saying, I'm going to make a sacrifice of love in response to what Jesus did in giving his life to set me free. So the fasting and the abstinence that has varied over the centuries, but that current discipline is what we're bound by. Yeah. You know, and then with guidance, people can make other choices too. Now, it seems like spiritually we should, you know, take the, the um, you know, meatless Fridays in the right direction and, and fulfill the spirit of it, you sure. know, because people ask about, you know, meatless burgers. Right. And, you know, but also I would imagine if it's Friday and you're eating pizza or, right. you know, right. like, you know, uh, you know, shrimp Thai, you know, pad Thai right. or something like that. It's like, right. OK, am I really uh, am I getting the point? Yeah. Right. <laughs> the yeah, lobster tail. Like, hey, it's you know, not meat. Right. Right. <laughs> Listen, I mean, I have letter of the law. Right. But like how, how should we kind of, you know, mentally or at least spiritually prepare ourselves? Because it's kind of like you were saying with the gym. Right. Right. Being in the gym doesn't get you in shape, right. working out. But that also doesn't mean you need to be killing yourself on every machine. No, There's right. appropriate, like, if it's if it's not comfortable and you don't really like it, you're probably doing it right. Right. You know? Right. And, I mean, again, it's that kind of twinge. Because, we, I mean, we 
have an abundance in the West of food and availability and stuff, you know. So giving up meat isn't like the hugest thing because again, yeah. you gotta, I could have, fine, I'll give up a steak. I'm gonna have this big old pile of macaroni and cheese with right, yeah. cheeses in it and <laughs> my lobster thing or whatever. And it's fascinating because you can have, you can have crocodile, you can have frog legs. What was that oh, that's one? so funny. Yeah, yeah I've heard, done, I've heard some of these because amphibious things, you know, turtle. Uh, it's like cold blooded versus warm blood, but turtle, frog. And crocodile are permitted, That's you know. And then somebody asked the question about the meatless burgers, and I say it. I think personally, I wouldn't do it, and it violates. They think the spirit of Lent, but the law permits it because you got to think about meatless burgers were created for people who won't eat meat. They yeah. are opposed to meat. They're they're offended yeah. or they choose to sacrifice. So it's a trick. It's fake yeah. meat. So legally. Yes, the law would permit it. Do I think you should all run out and buy it? No, first of all, because I think it'd be, I think everyone's going to be offended. I think fake meat sounds horrible. I would never <laughs> eat it. I'm not going to do it. But you're right. The point is, though, it's Friday, and the Lord is asking us to give up meat and to live, you know, a little bit simply. You know, maybe you don't want to have that tuna casserole, but that's kind of a penance. Yeah. You know, or you really want to have big. Fancy, you know, I have super deluxe five cheese pizza. Well, just maybe have white pizza. You know, again. Yeah, yeah. But again, the point is, is that, but at the same time, too, you got to think you're married, you have a family, um, you know, you got your kids in the minivan, you're going through the drive through, okay, you know, or you're home, you got through the week and you're doing online learning and you're totally stressing out and your marriage is stressed. Fine, eat the luxurious macaroni and cheese. It's legally, you're not yeah. eating meat. But if you don't bite your head off your spouse or your kids, yeah, or you know, okay, you know, because I mean, the penance, you know, we gotta say my penance isn't to be someone else's penance, <laughs> you know, and yeah, it's yeah, kind of yeah. like you want the best for your children, you want your kids, you know, parents want their kids to get the PhD at MIT, and they want you know everybody to be you know Olympic athletes, but we we the, the church like a mother sets a low bar. So she said, look, if you can do this, this is good. Yeah. It's a victory. Because you talked earlier about the, your son being repentant of something. Yeah. And Therese has a good analogy of two brothers who get in trouble for the same infraction, and they're going to get punished by their dad. And one kid is hiding in the corner for fear of, like, the belt or a real whooping or something. The other son, in a cocky way, throws himself with confidence into the lap or the arms of his dad and says, I, Daddy, Daddy, I love you. I'll never do it again. Well, the dad knows in five seconds he's going to be back at it. Yeah. And he wants his son to honor him and respect him, but he much more wants that his son would have confidence in his love. Yeah. You know, so I would say in our crazy culture with COVID, with everything you're doing, yes. You know, if you have to choose between like super extreme or super luxurious indulgent within the law, aim for the middle. Right, right. But, you know, if you're single <clears throat> or you have a little bit more discipline in your life, yes, you can even be simpler. But, you know, if you're busy raising a family and you got through e-learning for yeah. another week, you're like, okay, we're having a lobster and it's okay. You know, <laughs> I'm not recommending this. I don't want to get the bishop to come down and get me. You know? But so it's, it's, again, it's like, where are you in the gym? Yeah. You're working out. You're making efforts. You're making good choices. You know, maybe it's more of a discipline to give up Netflix. Yeah. You know, or to get to sleep. And early. if you're eating cheese pizza with your kids, talk to your kids about why isn't there pepperoni on the yeah, pizza? Right. You know, maybe we're gonna all right, we're gonna have pizza, but we're gonna do one a rosary after as a family. Right, 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 you know, right. to kind of calm down from there. Sure. There's ways I think to to do that. Um but you know, I, when you mentioned about like frog legs and yeah, turtle yeah. and a crocodile, yeah. I have to imagine that some poor bishop in our church's yeah. history was chased down by a person asking about and talking about amphibious creatures and he's right. like, All right, all right, fine, I'll talk to the Pope. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he takes it to Rome. Right. Some council has to review it. And then, so it's like, it's when you hear that, it almost sounds like the church is being silly. I'm like, no, no. Some guy like me no, there's always pestered a reason, his poor right, bishop. Right. <laughs> well, I always think too, like, okay, we get in a plane or somehow get down to Louisiana on a Friday and let, and have go to Good Fish Fry and have yeah, those right. Stuff. I'm not going to feel too paying attention, but it's like, ooh, I'm really living this season. So, so last, uh, last topic within this. Um, you're preparing people for RCA to come into the church. What are you noticing? You know, we're in a unique time in church's history. You know, we, we've kind of gone through a, a, another iteration of the abuse crisis yes, where faith yes. in the church is a bit weakened. And we've also gone through one of the strangest years, right. at least in the history of the church in America, right. where we haven't had, we've had a dispensation for mass right. for almost a year. We're right. closing in on right. a year. Right. While many are going, you know, many are not. Right. What are you noticing from the folks who are choosing to come to the church now? Like, what's their disposition? What are, what's maybe unique about them that you don't always see in prior years? Well, that's interesting, because I was going to say that I noticed that, you know, the Lord is always at work. Yeah. Everybody who comes to the parish and who contacts us, you know, you can come to the church any day of the year, but, you know, the 
celebrates the Paschal mystery in the Triduum, leading up to Easter Vigil, and I mean, including Easter Vigil and Easter Sunday. These are such powerful days where we're walking with the Lord in these in the holiest of weeks. So we aim for that, and with most of our parishes. But people coming across our doorstep or contacting us by email or calling or somehow getting in contact with the parish, God is working in their life. Um, <clears throat> and they are on a journey. Now, you ought to find the best training setup for that person. Now, somebody mm-hmm. comes to you and they have, they're not baptized and they have no real formal religious instruction and their parents were particularly devout. So they're just asking some big open questions. So like I might point them as part of our process to that series, The Search on Formed, because it's just mm-hmm. yeah. a really great way to engage. Why am I here? Who am I? Who is God? And these are great things. And then you have other people come to you. They've read every Scott Hahn book on the planet. They listen to 15 podcasts. You know, yeah. They're reading the encyclicals in Latin. And so they're just chomping <laughs> at the bit. And somehow as a parish, you know, again, like the gym thing, you're trying to serve all these different things. I think what's interesting for me is that before, under normal or in, in normal circumstances, we have that obligation to go to Mass on Sunday. And probably just like Lent, we say, why do I have to go? Or, you know, yeah, blah, blah, right. blah. Now you don't have to go. But what's fascinating to me is, or it's not binding, you understand, um, is that, you know, they did this Gallup survey that showed that 80% of people reported poor mental health in the America in the past year for all these understandable reasons. But there was about 20% of people who reported the same or more excellent mental health. And these were people who were able to continue worshiping or some kind of religious practice. That's fascinating. It is. And I think part of it is showing that you go to Mass, and you don't like Father Lundberg's homily, and he's blathering on, and you don't like this particular song, and your rear end's numb in the pew, and when can we get to Dunkin' Donuts afterwards, and the kids are crawling all over you. <laughs> like, why do I have to be here? Well, God's grace is at work. He didn't set it up so you have to be at the Vatican with the Sistine Chapel Choir and Fulton Sheen. I mean, thank goodness, because I'd be failing. But no matter whether it's a little chapel or a large suburban parish or wherever you're going to Mass, God comes to you and to your family, and he meets you. And in ways you don't often realize, you know, we do need community of some kind. You know, following all these careful precautions, Mm -hmm. we need a fellowship as much as we can do it. We need connection with friends. I mean, we can do it with Zoom calls or carefully distance and stuff. People need this. Worship is part of who we are. We don't just pray individually within our hearts, which is where we have that fire, but corporally with the body in the larger congregation as part of the church. And so I think what's surprising is realizing, you know, people talk about the reset or global reset. So, well, I think God's doing the global reset too for a lot of people because things we would have just said, why do I have to go to church to worship? I don't need to join a gym. I can work out at home. Well, great. And if that's working for you, awesome. But if you suddenly realize I don't have to go right now, and maybe I'm staying away because I've got somebody with comorbidities in my family and I got to be careful, yeah. but they start to have hunger for it. Yeah. They, like I was stunned because <laughs> we started streaming all these things online. And I thought, you know, all my prisoners are going to watch Father Mike Schmitz. He's got hair, perfect teeth, <laughs> yeah. great podcast. Yeah, yeah. he's so funny. And I'm like, okay, this bald guy waddling around on the <laughs> altar at Sacred Heart in Winchester. But the prisoners want to see their church. Yeah. They wanted to see their home, you know, or the yeah. ones who use that service. So <clears throat> I think what's surprising me with people coming into the church is that more than ever, you see God is at work because there are a million reasons not to believe. There are lots of stumbling blocks, right? The root, Father yeah. Fred Miller points out the root word of scandal is scandaliso. It, it, the Roman army, when they would conquer an army, they would leave these big stones and boulders in the road so that army couldn't regroup. So stumbling blocks stop people from getting back on their track or back on path. So whether it's abuse scandal or hypocrisy or whatever in the church or it's crisis of belief, there are a lot of stumbling blocks for people. And now, so it's understandable. But <clears throat> in spite of all that, whether it's through technology or reading or friendship, conversation, just how the spirit is working, God is drawing people to himself And Pope Benedict had made the point back in the 60s that the church in the future would be poorer and simpler, but wouldn't have as much clout as it used to have. But it would be a community of believers, and that would be attractive because all these people now, we have technology, we have success, we have all these good things, but people are still looking for something. And I think they wouldn't have argued with, accepted it because of our prestige or influence or just kind of this moralizing. But I think now people are realizing something's missing. Yeah. And they need something more. They don't, re- they don't understand what's that supernatural outlook. What does faith mean? Is that just like superstition? 
Or is that actually a real belief based on the fact that Jesus rose from the dead? And I think more and more people are responding to that. So he's still working, and I think the need for us gradually and safely and prudently to rebuild parish life and the faith of the community is more valuable than ever. And so I think it's really fascinating. I completely agree. No, I think the I, I think this is for a lot of people kind of shaking up their thinking on it because you know I have little ones right now. They're you know seven, five, and four, and they were a year younger than that this time last year, obviously. And you know, mass is hard with those ages. Totally. You know, they're eighteen and seventy months apart. You so, can't even bribe them right now with donuts because there's no donuts after mass. <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah, like it was it was it was really challenging. And then you have this dispensation, and, and frankly, you, for a little while, you feel like, oh, okay, this is guilty, not, but this, this is, is not so yeah. bad. I'm yeah. being honest with you. But then then there came a point where it's like I'm noticing not just for myself that something's missing, I'm noticing something's missing for them. Right. And so, you know, we, we started, you know, this was kind of later in the when we knew more about COVID and how it spread and all that kind of sure. stuff. We started going back at least to weekday masses sure. at first. Sure. And sure, sure. I noticed a definite imp- change with the kids. Their outlook was different. They were very stressed through it. Like we didn't realize it at first. And then when we started realizing that, we're like, oh, this isn't good. But it's made a big difference for them. So I'm hoping that the good that comes out um, it's like the, um, uh, the the quote about the Christian Revolution. Um, I'm forgetting the saint. They're blanking on. Yeah. Um, talks about how God can convert pain into fruitful suffering and turn yes. a bad thing into something good. It doesn't mean it was a good thing. Right. Sometimes society says, right. "Oh, I love all my mistakes because it yeah, made me." Ho- no, right. no, no. That's not the way it works. Right. <laughs> the miracle is that God took that bad thing and converted Things it good into good something people, good. Right. And I, I'm hoping that the conversion that happens in this to something good is that people realize that they yearn for it. I right. think we were so fed and everything was so available before right, right. that now Take we realize granted. what we actually want. We're not missing restaurants that much. We're not missing right. bowling alleys that much. Right. We are missing right. the most important things in life, community right. and faith. Yeah. And I, I think, and that's why I think a lot of pastors are saying like, you know, we're, we're kind of at capacity for a lot of masses right. within the, the right. safety regulations. Right. So are. it's like, we're, we're, what, what do we do if more people wanted to come? That's, that's kind of becoming the it's question I've talked to, to pastors. Yeah. Oh, without a doubt. With regard to Lent and all that, is there anything I missed that we should have uh, should Well, have I would over? just say that I learned so much working at the high school and working with the National Dominicans and with the kids. And um, I would just say it was fascinating because, you know, it could be tempting for a believer today, uh, lay people, priests, religious, everybody, to get discouraged. We have in a very secular culture. There's all kinds of heat or opposition that we face. But I think if we look at it more as opportunity, it can change things. You know, so you could sit there and say to a kid, hey, did you get to Mass this Sunday? They say, oh, no, we were really busy. And they mean that in all sincerity. And you're kind of like, oh, you know. But then if I flip it around, okay, this kid, my mythical student, you know, plays lacrosse. And he doesn't just play lacrosse at the high school. He's on a travel select team. He's on a rec team. He might be on three different teams. He goes to practice every day. He knows all the positions on the team. He kind of worships his coach. He wears the swag. He walks around after school with his stick and the ball bouncing it off the wall, mm-hmm. damaging the walls. Um, on the weekends, he's in a tournament with four or five games on the weekend. In the summer, he goes to two or three camps. Dad videotapes everything. And so you'd say they're religious about lacrosse because they understand this connection between, first of all, they like the game. They enjoy it. And then they want to thrive at it, and they want to keep building on their strengths, and they want to push themselves to the next level. You don't just have a kid go, I mean, they might say it, uh, in third grade, I went to the lacrosse game. Okay, tomorrow I'm doing everything. You know, And so if we realize parents drive that, you know, I mean, in a good way. The parents who love sports or they love academics or they want their kids to do as best they can with SATs and their best aim for college, they put in all kinds of healthy but challenging structures and plans and disciplines in place to help their child to flourish. Mm-hmm. And the big challenge for all of us for the church is that people have lost the narrative they don't have a relationship with the Lord. They haven't heard the good news. And so all of these structures and things we have in place often just don't make sense to them. Why do I have to go to Mass? How, can I eat a fake meat burger on Friday? Yeah. And these are good questions to ask. You know, it's good to kind of start probing there. I remember in, in college, um, my sweet mates on Fridays of Lent would order a meat lover's pizza and be sitting there in the dorm. And at 12 o'clock, they were saying, bless us, O Lord, on Saturday morning <laughs> and eating their meat lover pizza. And I thought, well, that was kind of a tribute to the faith, you know, because they were observing the discipline. But so look at Lent kind of like maybe you would look at how you help your children do well academically or athletically or in the arts. See of it, whether it's a gym or a training program, it's 
trying to grow in this reception of God's love, try to clear out, sacrifice things that are good in order to make room for something that is better. And yeah. if you're just at the point of saying, I don't know God and I have all these questions and I don't believe in him, fine, talk to him about that. Just carve some time out to talk. Do that Mike Schmidt's Bible podcast, do something. Yeah. So just look at this as an opportunity and realize it's not, I think for many Catholics, we force them to play a sport that they don't like to play. But when you like this game, you want to learn how to play it, how it works, and how to get better. And when you mm -hmm. find out that God loves you and that all of this is designed to help you grow and be stretched and increase your capacity to thrive and be happy, not just in this life but in eternity, then this starts to make sense. And you, you take a balanced approach. You don't want to burn yourself out. You don't want to underdevelop. And so you want a custom plan. And just ask, you know, at the end of the day, I would just say ask the Blessed Mother, you know, Our Lady of Sorrows. Um, she walked with Jesus in his worst time. She was there at the foot of the cross, but she was your mother there too. She was praying for you. You know, she was giving her life to, to the Christ for the church for you. And she can help you. You don't know where to start. You don't know how to pray. You don't know what to do for Lent. Ask the Blessed Mother. She'll help you. And then Lent will be a change. It'll be challenging, but it'll be fruitful, like you think. Very good. Father, thank you so much You're for welcome. joining me on the podcast. You're listening to Searching for More. If you enjoyed this podcast, please write a review on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Also, make sure you follow the Diocese and the Arlington Catholic Herald on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And subscribe to our YouTube channels for regular videos that inspire, educate, and inform about the Catholic faith in our diocesan community.